Okay, let's see what um, does that complex dispersion relation, having a complex index refraction, do to a plane wave? All right, well, let's start and just write sort of the easy version of a plane wave where it's just along one axis where E equals some amplitude E to the J, say it's going along Z minus omega T and say I hat, doesn't really matter. And the dispersion relation we came up with was that omega equals speed of light over a big mess, and we'll, which again, we'll just write as in real plus in imaginary at each wavelength that has some real part, some imaginary part, times the wave number k. Okay. So now, what we want to do is plug the, the uh, dispersion relation into here. So we could say E equals E naught, E to the j. And then you could ask yourself, should I solve it for k and put it here, or should I solve it for omega and put it here, or should I do both or neither? And to answer that, you got to think a little bit about what's really happening here. We're talking about light in vacuum and then light in a dielectric. And in the next unit, we'll talk about how it gets from one to the other at the interface. But for now, if you think of the interface, the light comes from vacuum or air. And at the surface of the dielectric, it starts to vibrate those electrons in the surface. And that vibration vibrates the next electrons and emits light and vibrates the next electrons. So really, the frequency has to stay the same. Okay. You can't have an interface where one side is vibrating at one frequency and one side is vibrating at a different frequency. That doesn't happen. An interface is, is, is infinitely thin. You would shear the electrons in half, which, of course, you can't do. So the other way to think about it is that you might wonder, well, it looks so symmetric. Why is it one over the other? And it's because of the type of boundary condition we have. This is a boundary condition in space for all time. So it's the spatial part that changes. It's a boundary condition in space where the index changes in space but it's constant in time. So the answer is you substitute for k. Okay? So I am going to solve this for um, k and say it's going to be k is omega times n real plus n imaginary um, times that, uh, uh, let's see, over c. So that's the k part and then times z and then minus omega t, that's the same, I hat. So there you go. We have applied this dispersion relation to this plane wave to see what happens. Okay. So, oh, let's see, I forgot my little part that actually makes it complex. There's a j there, and there's a j there. <coughs> there we go. I knew something was wrong. Okay, <coughs> so now we can distribute this j and see something interesting happens. E, electric field, amplitude, E, and if you distribute the j, the omega n r over c part remains a complex exponential because it's just j times those. But now the imaginary part has a j in front of it. So the j times the j makes negative 1. So you have e to the minus, oh, uh, minus negative 1 is the j squared. And you have omega n i over c z. So I'm going to write that as n imaginary omega over c z. So we have a part that looks like it's going to decay. Uh, exponential decay with position. Interesting. And then we have the rest of the exponential that is all complex, and that is e to the j, and the real part survived. I'm going to call it n real omega over c z minus omega t. I had. So that's what it does to the plane wave. Okay. So before we get into the implications of that, I want to point out that we want to think about omega over c. What is omega over c? Well, let's just define it first, and then we'll talk about really what it means um, in a minute. So omega over c, well, it looks like a wave number, right? Omega over c, we call that k naught. It's the vacuum wave number. Or if we had a vector, it'd be the vacuum wave vector. And you could also think in terms of uh, lambda, then you also must have something called lambda naught, which is 2 pi over k naught. And that's the vacuum wavelength. 
I'll get to what those mean in a minute. I just wanted to define them now so that I can, I can write them in. So now let's write it out with our vacuum components in it. And it's the E field equals E naught E to the minus, and let's see, if that's just K naught, it's E to the minus N I K naught Z. The imaginary part of the dielectric function, or the refractive index, K naught Z. And then the oscillating part, or the complex exponential, E to the J. And let's look over here. In real, K naught Z. In real, K naught Z minus omega t i hat still, say. OK? So that is about as simple as we, as we, care to, we need to write it right now. So now let's look at this plane wave and figure out what's happening. OK? So it's a plane wave. It has some amplitude. But we recognize this as a decay of the amplitude. So this is amplitude decay. Because this exponential is not oscillating, it's just going down, and it's modifying the amplitude. So really, what goes in front of the oscillating part is an amplitude that's dropping with z. So as this thing moves forward in the dielectric medium, it's, it, it, it goes away. Its amplitude decays. So what that tells us is that the imaginary part of the refractive index leads to absorption. Ab absorption, maybe. So dielectric materials can absorb light. And that's what that, that parameter means. We could also look at uh, this and say, well, usually that tells us the wavelength or, and the wave number. What's in front of that is the wavelength. And what this tells us is that it, the plane wave has reduced wavelength, basically, with nr. Instead of being at the wave number, it would be in vacuum it's at a larger wave number. A larger wave number means um, a smaller wavelength. So when the plane wave goes into the dielectric, its wavelength actually contracts. So you can write that the lambda in the dielectric is lambda naught, the vacuum wavelength, over the real part of the dielectric of the refractive index. Okay, And that really happens. And that's why whenever we talk about light, we refer to the vacuum wavelength and the vacuum wave number. Because every time light goes into a, dielect a different dielectric, its wavelength changes. And it would get very confusing if you said, well, the wavelength in air, or the wavelength in, in the material, or the wavelength in this, we just call it the vacuum wavelength. We could also speak in terms of just the frequency. That never changes. But when we want to talk about the spatial part, it's always a vacuum wavelength. We often don't put the knot on there. But pretty much, you almost always, unless you're asked in a physics problem, refer to the vacuum wavelength. And then we could also say, what is the, the, that we have reduced velocity. We've slowed the wave down. Because what is the phase velocity? The phase velocity is whatever is here divided by whatever is here. Right? So that is omega over n real k naught. And what is omega over k naught? That's c, the speed of light. It's over there. So it's c over the real part of the dielectric of the refractive index. All right. So we sort of have seen three different effects of going into the medium. You'd have some absorption. The light might go away. Uh, you shorten the wavelength, and you slow it down. And you slow it down a lot. Right? So for uh, glass, n is 1.5. So you drop the speed of the light from 3 times 10 to the 8 down to uh, divided by uh, 1.5 is uh, something else, uh, 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And it really does happen. So the absolute constant speed of light uh, refers to light in a vacuum. Light in a material, it does, it does slow down. Um, so now what we want to do is figure out if this is all real. Okay. So what we're going to do is first we need a plane wave. All right. So I have a laser pointer here, and this will serve as a plane wave. It's uh, got a little dirty. There we go. So it's just a standard laser pointer. It makes a green beam. And you may say that's a pretty poor approximation of a plane wave. Right? A plane wave is supposed to be infinite extent. 
And that's true, you can't make a plane wave. You can't make something infinite in extent. This is pretty small, but if you were to look at the scale of the wavelength of the light, that's what really matters, this spot is really big. Okay? So it's an approximation, this makes a pretty good plane wave. It's just a little circle, a little circular chunk of a plane wave. This fish tank has our dielectric medium. It's a fish tank full of water. Okay? So I'm going to turn the laser on and then just let it pass through the water and we will see what happens, okay? So there, you can see the beam. And actually, it appears to, if you think about it, break all these rules, right? So first you could ask, why are we even seeing it, right? I mean, I don't see it here. Why are we suddenly seeing it in a dielectric? Um, the reason for that is simply that I put a little bit of milk in this water so that the little milk particles would scatter the light out. That way you can actually see the beam, okay? So let's see, what did we confirm? The light is propagating, that's good. So we said the light should propagate in the medium, so we got that part right. Light is clearly pop propagating through this dielectric medium where water is the dielectric medium. Um, what else could we say? We also predicted that the amplitude would decay in the dielectric medium. Well, that doesn't appear to be happening. Right? So here, it looks like pretty much the same brightness of the beam all the way across. So that seems to be a problem. Well, that one's easy to explain. The absorption is very small. At visible uh, frequencies, visible wavelengths, water and glass, this is very teeny. So you won't even see how much this is being absorbed. So it's not quite detectable. So it is being absorbed. It's just little, OK? Um, what else did we predict? We said there would be a reduced wavelength in the medium. Well, there doesn't appear to be. So when I buy this and I read about it, it says, but it's 532 nanometers. So of course it means the vacuum wavelength. So here that's what 532 nanometers looks like. It's green. And now in a dielectric, we said the wavelength should drop to 532 over, in this case, 1.33. So that would be, I don't know, 400 and something. It should turn blue. Right? So the wavelength in there is in the blue range. It doesn't look blue. So is that wrong? What have we done? Let's think. Well, maybe. The wavelength slowed down, shortened, and it's blue in there, but we see it out here. So it's, the light is scattering off the milk particles back into air, and then it's back at 532, it gets to our eye. But inside of there, it's at 400 and something, and it's blue. So if you look at it in there, is it really blue in there? Well, there's only one way to find out. So let's have a look here. I'll get a look at it. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's still green. It's not blue at all, still green. So it seems like this prediction might not be correct. Well, here's the deal. You don't see wavelength, you see frequency, okay? So when I looked in there, it still looked green, and that's because even though it was at a lower wavelength of 400 and something nanometers, it was vibrating on the photoreceptor on my eye at a frequency, right? So your eye detects with a surface. A surface can't measure a wavelength. A surface can only measure a frequency. So what really matters is the frequency, and the frequency is the same here as it is here as it is here. Another reason that wasn't a very smart demo is your, water, your eye only ever sees anything in water because your retina is inside your eye, which is full of liquidy stuff, right? So you've never seen uh, light at the vacuum wavelength, come to think of it. I wish I'd have thought of that a minute ago. So anyway, it looks like all of our predictions are true. Oh, there's this one, the reduced velocity. This one, you just have to trust me. I can't demo the speed of light here or even one, -fifth, or one over 1.5 the speed of light. But the light does effectively slow down inside a dielectric medium.